it's, it's truly an honor uh, to get to introduce our two really very distinguished speakers today. Um, the first is our very own um, Alex Kapelowitz, who is a professor and vice chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the David Geffen School of Medicine here. Um, he is the medical director of San Fernando Mental Health Center, um, and he is also um, chief of psychiatry at all of you, um, UCLA Medical Center. And he has been a frequent lecturer in um, biobehavioral treatments and psychiatric rehabilitation techniques. He has written over 100 articles and book chapters on these subjects. Um, he has been the recipient of several grants from the National Institute of Mental Health and the National Alliance for Research on Schizophrenia and Depression. His work is focused on culturally adapting evidence-based psychosocial treatment approaches for Hispanic Americans with serious mental illness. And, you know, I'd really like to say I've followed uh, Alex's career, and he is the nicest kind of um, uh, unassuming guy who's done such important work over the years. It's really uh, wonderful to have him part of the department in here speaking today. Um, and um, he's joined by uh, a former UCLA uh, uh, professor, uh, Stephen Lopez, who's a professor of psychology and social work at um, USC. He was in, uh, he's been at USC for 21 years, which doesn't even seem possible, and was at UCLA for 15 years. He's really dedicated his career as an academic clinician psychologist to the integration of a cultural perspective in clinical research assessment intervention and training. Um, he really is one of the best known uh, researchers in the country on how to bring uh, mental health care, quality care to Latino populations. Um, he's, he also has had a number of grants over the years and um, has worked on family factors in the course of schizophrenia, particularly among Mex Mexican origin families on both sides of the U.S. border. Um, he had an NIH-funded summer training program in Mexico um, for many years where 131 undergraduate graduate students got to participate in this really important cross-cultural experience. And um, it's my honor to say I w uh, got to work with Steve on the Surgeon General's report that was focused on minority mental health uh, many years ago. I hesitate to even think how many years ago <laughs> Steve and I have known each other. So it's, it's really wonderful. We're really looking forward to your talk today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Miranda, for that kind introduction, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, thank the organizing committee for inviting us, um, and it's a real special honor to, to share the podium with uh, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Alex Kapalowicz. I'd like to also point out uh, he's got a wonderful heart and a uh, wonderful human being, and it's been a real pleasure to work with him. Um, okay, so uh, actually this all started one day. I was traveling to Mexico, and I decided uh, to give Alex a call. Uh, and I said, Alex, you know, everybody's talking about why is it that Mexican-Americans, Latinos aren't using mental health resources. Why don't we do something about it? Let's get people into services. What can we do? Are you, are you on, on, on board? And he said, yes. And so this, that started this, this kind of journey that I want to share with you today. Uh, we're really excited about the initiatives to promote mental health services for early psychosis. SAMHSA in 2014 established block grants uh, to, to bring services, uh, early interventions uh, throughout the nation. A number of coordinated specialty care centers are being established as, as we speak. Uh, NIMH has established the uh, EpiNet uh, to bring together organized, organized clinics and networks of services, uh, informatics, big data, to monitor the progress of care and to evaluate it and to improve services. So there's a great deal of initiative, and this is really important for researchers as well, because the earlier we get it, identifying folks with the illness, we can better understand what are the factors that contribute to this. And so there's a lot of excitement. Our, we're concerned, however, that there's not enough attention to issues of diversity. We're concerned, however, that there's not enough attention to communities, underrepresented communities. And so uh, we have conducted a study funded by the National Institute of Mental Health to actually see if we can 
bring services, uh, early psychosis, people of color, in particular Latino community, and we're gonna share that with you today. We're gonna share that journey, and we're gonna share what we learned about it and where we need to go so that we can make sure other, ser other communities that are underserved get the attention that they need in this special initiative, this really important initiative. All right, uh, so first of all, let me give you a little bit of background for those that may not be uh, uh, as uh, familiar with this literature. Why is it important to intervene early? Uh, Marshall and uh, Perkins had early literature reviews to indicate that the longer the duration of untreated psychosis, which is the period of the onset of the illness, to when most in most studies when they're first administered antipsychotic medication. So it's that time delay between onset of the illness to uh, first uh, antipsychotic medication. The length of the duration of untreated psychosis is associated with worse symptoms, as you can imagine, and worse social functioning. And then uh, Jan Olaf Johannesson in Norway, Scandinavians and Australians have really been the leaders in this literature. Jan Olaf uh, Johannesson and his colleagues actually demonstrated that you can reduce the duration of untreated psychosis. In a quasi-experimental study conducted in Norway and Copenhagen, uh, two sites in Norway, they pointed out that in one site that had a campaign as well as an early intervention service, a campaign and early intervention service, they were able to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis from 16 weeks to five weeks. In contrast, in two sites that didn't have the campaign but did have the early intervention service, they did not reduce the duration of untreated psychosis. So it's the first time that we've been able to reduce it and everybody's excited about that. That's good reason. And then of course, John Kane's work, the RAISE study, points out one coordinated specialty care, Navigate was their particular program. They certainly demonstrated that the, that particular service can improve outcomes, uh, social functioning, also symptoms. But the important point of that study is that what moderated those findings was the duration of untreated psychosis. So those who were low in duration of untreated psychosis had more benefit than those who were high in duration of untreated psychosis. And so Kane argued it's really important that we make an effort to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis. Uh, and one, his main point was that we can, people can maximize the benefits for treatment. So these are the reasons why it's important that we intervene early and we apply coordinated specialty care. Now, some of you may not be familiar, but this, these are some of the characteristics of the coordinated specialty care that was used in the RAISE program. So you have family psychoeducation, you have individualized medication, you have supported employment, education, and then also resilience-focused individual therapy. The idea, bring the best package together so that you can reduce the duration of improve outcomes for folks with early psychosis. All right, what are some of the limitations? Well, one limitation, it's hard to do. It's hard to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis. In Schizophrenia Bulletin in 2018, there was a review, a meta-analysis of 16 studies. All right, there have been a scattered number of studies that have shown that you can reduce it, but when you lump them all together, there's no effect, no effect. The second thing is that all of these 16 published articles are in high-income countries. No published articles looking at trying to reduce untreated psychosis in low-income countries. And then when you look at those high-income countries that are participating in these, uh, these campaigns to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis, there's a lot of diversity in the samples, a lot of diversity in the samples, UK, Australia, but there's little attention to how to address the needs of those diverse communities, specifically the ethnic and minority communities within those high income countries. The best example is Chan. He has a study in reducing the duration of untreated psychosis. They were successful in doing so. Uh, they had a docudrama that was televised they had four different language versions of this docudrama. But there's no discussion about should the message be differently, uh, be different for one group than the other. It's just about language. So uh, my main point here is that there's little attention to how to consider culture in addressing underrepresented groups. And the last limitation is that this initiative to push for coordinated specialty care, we very much support that. But what's being left out is the outreach part. What's being left out are the community campaigns. And if you think back of the first successful uh, study, the TIPS program in Norway, it was the, the campaign, the site that had the campaign and the clinical service that ended up reducing the duration of untreated psychosis. So we're concerned that, 
that by not uh, talking more about and considering more about the campaign itself, then particularly uh, communities of color, underrepresented groups, are going to not benefit as greatly from, from, these, from these campaigns. Now, one of the reasons why it's hard to do this, uh, to re reduce the duration of untreated psychosis, and why just coordinated specialty care by itself isn't enough to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis, you need to think conceptually about the pathways to care. So people encounter some changes in their family. A son or a daughter may start withdrawing or may act in some kind of odd way. Well, families have to consider this predicament and then make a transition to say something's up and maybe talk to the teacher, the counselor, primary care provider. And then in those social networks, then the idea is that they're gonna refer needed to a specialty care. Right, so there's three main uh, pathways that Rogler and Cortez uh, conceptualized in a very straightforward paradigm. But we need to consider that. For example, one of the initial endeavors that was out of UK with Max Birchwood and his group, uh, they trained uh, primary care providers to identify psychosis. And they did a great job of doing that. And then they followed up over a year, the idea being primary care providers receive patients with psychosis, they're gonna move them to specialty care. We're gonna see a reduction in the ratio of untreated psychosis. Guess what? The primary care did, primary care providers did that, but what's missing? Well, even, they're not considering the role of the family. They're not considering the delays that are taking place before the primary care gets them, right? So you really need, this is, a, this is hard to do, reducing duration of untreated psychosis, but you need to think of the different pathways. All right, and so just coordinated specialty care is not enough. All right, we have a, both Dr. Kapelowitz and I have a strong interest in personal and longstanding professional interest in improving services for Latinos. Um, and as, as you all know, they uh, represent the largest ethnic minority community in the nation and also in the state of California. And used to be thought that Latinos don't use mental health services. And then Jeannie Miranda, Jeannie uh, Margarita Alegria, a good friend of Jeannie Miranda's, uh, in the end last study showed that, no, it's not, uh, you know, Cubans, uh, people of Cuban descent or Puerto Ricans, they're making relative use of mental health services as, as Euro-Americans. But there are specific groups that aren't. And the ones that aren't are adults of Mexican origin, immigrants, and Spanish-speaking. So if you look at service use of folks of those groups with anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, substance use disorders, they're using services much less than other groups. So we would think then that Latinos, those specific groups are then at high risk for uh, uh, a prolonged duration of untreated psychosis. And so our focus of our project was on a, is in a Latino community here in, San, in uh, Southern California in San Fernando Valley. Dr. Capella was to share a little bit more about that. And our focus of our project was to develop a campaign, not associated or affiliated with a coordinated specialty care, that would be ideal, but a campaign that was focused on the community as well as professional networks to get the word out in terms of what psychosis is and where they can receive care in the San Fernando Valley. That was the focus, but we did not work with a coordinated specialty care program. Now, if we're going to develop a campaign, what kinds of guidelines can we use? Well, if you look at the literature, the literature is pretty weak in terms of guiding anybody in terms of how they want to develop a campaign. Um, generally, when you read the literature, everybody assumes that the reason why there's a, a, uh, there's a delay in uh, treatment, a duration of untreated psychosis, is the lack of psychosis literacy the lack of an understanding of what psychosis is and how to, how to address it, okay? That's the assumption. But how do people conceptualize psychosis literacy? How do people measure psychosis literacy? How do people intervene to improve or enhance? That literature isn't there. Of those 16 studies, people are interested in the outcomes. Did they get an outcome? There are very few studies that look at the processes that lead to the outcomes of the uh, a change in the duration of untreated psychosis. So we were kind of on our own, not completely, but we we're kind of on our own to think about conceptually what is psychosis literacy. 
we drew on the Institute of Medicine's 2004 report, uh, which is pretty much a kitchen sink if anybody's looked at that report. It's, it's a very elaborate, um, all kinds of aspects to health literacy. We drew on a really small component in other literature as well. Uh, it's a simple idea that if you have knowledge of what psychosis is, you're more likely to attribute then the changes in behavior to a mental illness, and then in turn, you're more likely to seek services. In contrast, if you don't have the knowledge of psychosis, you're more likely to make attributions to the social world. You know, uh, they're having some job problems, uh, transition to college, stressors in their life, drugs, uh, poor peer influence, and you're not likely to seek mental health services. Uh, and as a result, you're gonna get a, re uh, a long delay in seeking treatment. So we drew on this conceptual model. The other thing is we've seen campaigns where you'll see on buses schizophrenia or you'll see words psychosis. Well, if you're gonna try and reach a community, try using the language of the people instead of the clinical or the technical languages that we bring as mental health professionals. And so we um, came up with a mnemonic device. I'll take two minutes to tell you the story behind this. My wife is from Puebla, Mexico. Her name's Leticia. I said, Leticia, look it, I want to teach people about psychosis. How about something like see cosas? Doesn't that sound good? See things? Isn't that like, sounds like psychosis? And she says, my wife who loves me so much, that sucks, Steve. And I said, well, why is that? Because it's in English and Spanish, if you want it for Spanish-speaking folks. So she took her thesaurus, the LaRue's thesaurus, and the Velasquez dictionary, and came back with this idea of clave. Clave, usen la clave, use the clue, use the key to identify psychosis, to identify serious mental illness and others. And why clave? Creencias falsas, delusions, lenguaje desorganizado, disorganized speech, and alucinaciones. And what kind of alucinaciones? Ver cosas, see things, or escuchar voces or sonidos or hear things. Usen la clave. So people can use this clave to identify symptoms. And it's informed our campaign. Uh, our brochures talk about the clave. Uh, we've developed a num another step is that we've developed educational resources. So the idea was we as professionals aren't going to be going out into the community. Instead, we want to develop resources, a toolkit, so community folks can go out there and get the message out. So we have live La Clave. Uh, we have, uh, we put uh, professional talking on a DVD and, and we use music, uh, Mana, we use video, Cantinflas, uh, Chespirito TV, those of you may know some of that to bring popular cultural icons to illustrate some of these concepts. Uh, we have a, um, a flip chart, um, the storytelling with very little words. Uh, we've trained promotoras on how to do this and some of the promotoras didn't know how to read and write. So it's really important that we use illustrations. And then we came up with a narrative film that was funded through this current project um, to actually illustrate. And so we have a number of resources that can be used in the toolkit. And the main point, I don't want to take up Dr. Capellos's time, but the main point is that each of these resources were informed by the conceptual model, and each of these resources we evaluated. We have um, real good data to indicate that we can increase psychosis literacy. Uh, for example, uh, in one of my favorite studies in Puebla, uh, Dr. Miranda mentioned that we had a summer program in Mexico, we, we used the Survey Gizmo platform. Survey Gizmo platform, you can randomly assign people online uh, to three different conditions. We had a TED talk on the environment, we had the class, the expert speaker, and we had the movie. And it was all about 20 minutes or so. Uh, and then, then we asked them after watching these uh, resources, uh, we presented a four minute clip, a video clip, about somebody talking about somebody with psychosis and they had hallucinations and they had creencias falsas and they had lenguaje desorganizado. And then what's going on with Elsa? So what you can see here, and there are 240 individuals from the Health Science Campus in Puebla who participate in this. And you can see in, those that got the TED talk said what's going on with Elsa, they referred to the social world, the divorce, the stressors in their life. Whereas the movie and the class, they referred less to the social world and instead referred to her psychosis. So this is an example of the evidence that we used and then they're more likely to make a referral to uh, suggest a professional care uh, and less likely to make suggestions on how to handle the situation on personal issues. 
So we felt like given our the past work conceptually and also the toolkit and the evidence that we're in a position to launch a campaign. And now Dr. Capellas will share a little bit about the campaign. I'm going to launch the campaign, I guess. Yes, okay. please. All right, very good. Well, thank you, and thank you also for that warm welcome, both from Steve and from Jeannie. I appreciate it. It's good to be here to, to be able to present to you. So I, I don't move around. I'm going to make it easier for whoever's doing the camera so I won't keep going back and forth. You can see each other. Okay. So uh, as Steve was giving you the background, the idea was is to conceptualize this educational campaign to inform the community about mental illness, specifically about psychosis, how to identify psychosis, and how to be able to take people to a place that they can get that treatment. So what we specifically did is we identified a particular area. And so where we are in San Fernando Valley, the northeast part of the San Fernando Valley, we selected a few uh, zip codes in there. And those of you who recognize uh, these are Arlita, San Fernando, Silmar, North Hills, Sun Valley, and Panorama City. Uh, each of those, as you can tell, have a large percentage of uh, Hispanic population. And of those Hispanic population, we know that many of them are first generation, mostly monolingual Spanish, and therefore the importance of what Steve was talking about, making sure that the message is delivered in Spanish. <clears throat> to give you a little bit more specific, so for those of you who, who every so often cross over the 101 and go into the valley, I know that's not a very common thing for our, the West Siders who are attending here today, but so we're talking about this area here uh, in, in the blue, uh, um, as I circle it here. So this is Silmar, Pacoima, Sun Valley, Arlita, Panorama City, and North Hills. So that's the area. Now, coincidentally, that happens to be the area where I work, which includes the San Fernando Mental Health Center here in Granada Hills, as well as this is all of you UCLA Medical Center, which is the other place that I work. Um, parenthetically, I wanted to mention to you that Oh, sorry, it didn't go that way. Okay, so here's the two spots. Um, when we originally conceptualized this um, approach, we wanted to make sure that people were able to come into our clinic so that after we do the educational campaign, they have some place to go. So we identified the clinic as a place to inform individuals that they can go there to receive services. But we also realized after a pretty short period of time during the campaign is that many of the folks would not necessarily come to an outpatient clinic and that many of the patients unfortunately would turn up instead in the psychiatric emergency room located at all of you. So the fact that I, I was able to, I work both at the outpatient mental health center as well as in the psychiatric emergency room at all of you made sure that we would at least capture most of the places that an individual will uh, be depending on the acuity of their symptoms when their uh, family members realize that there's something going on. So I just wanted to clarify that though it was a very convenient uh, ability to be able to broaden our, our net to include not just an outpatient clinic where people obviously are coming in voluntarily, but also in the psychiatric emergency room where they're dealing with emergencies that may be brought in not just by their family members, which is certainly possible, but also by police or perhaps even uh, psychiatric mobile response teams. So all these were available to them. We're going to tell you a little uh, anecdote that came about um, regarding this whole issue as well. So specifically, how do you do outreach? Who do you talk to? How do you reach out to them? And this uh, kind of uh, emphasizes a little bit more. Cut off a little. So a little bit more about what kind of to work with. Maybe I knocked it off. No, it's okay. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, maybe it's okay. Is that all right? Yeah. All right. Um, so the idea here is to look at a variety of different places where you would. Uh, try to uh, work and inform individuals as to uh, identifying psychosis and if they see it, where they would send uh, the folks to. So there's two general categories, as you can see here. One is sort of professionals and working with them, and the other one is the general public. So I'm going to describe to you the variety of places that we actually went out to as part of this educational campaign to educate that community as to the need for identifying psychosis and more importantly, what do you, when you see someone with psychosis, what do you send them? Okay. So one of the most common places that we uh, uh, were visiting is the swap meets. Swap meets are a really popular thing in the San Fernando Valley. They're in a lot of different places, but especially on the weekends, there are lots of people, hundreds if not thousands, that go to the swap meets all over the area that I showed you previously. So we were fortunate enough to uh, identify two wonderful promotoras 
uh, who I will show you their pictures in a minute, Eva and Rosalba, who would go to these swap meets just about every weekend and hand out pamphlets, sort of like this gentleman is doing here, that as you can see, if you look carefully, has la clave, the information that Steve was sharing a few minutes ago related to the, uh, the, the uh, uh, mnemonic that focuses on the different symptoms of psychosis. This is another example. We also did some professional networking. This was a health fair. Quite often, a lot of the uh, politicians in the area, either the local politicians or even, uh, this is a congressman, uh, Card Tony Cardenas, who uh, let us uh, piggyback on one of his uh, events that was a health fair that we could uh, identify with professionals as well as some of the locals that were coming to this meeting and would be able to discuss La Clave there. We also worked a bit as well with um, uh, Alex Padilla, which at the time was a councilman, now a secretary of state for the state of California. We developed a relationship with him. And so when he would have these political events, we could piggyback on there and meet quite a few of the folks uh, that were coming. Um, Another one that was an interesting one, this is more towards the general public, were these Saturday CCD classes, which Steve tells me has to do with catechism education, correct? That people who would go to, uh, you know, who were going through catechism would have to go to these classes on Saturday mornings. Sometimes they were happy about it, sometimes not so happy about it, but we would piggyback on those classes and do, the, uh, do a little bit of a presentation on La Clave. Steve would often go to those as well, as well as the promotoras. Uh, this is another example of a professional workshop with religious ministries. You probably are not too surprised to find out. Steve was talking a little bit about where do people go when they first recognize there's a problem. Go to primary care. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they go to their local minister. It could be their priest. And so we felt it was really important to reach out to the local churches and let them know about La Clave and that they could co come and, and send people to our clinic as well. And this is one example of Steve working with one of the local priests. We also worked with a lot of the primary care sites directly. So this is one of the clinics called Proyecto del Barrio that is a primary care. They have three sites actually in the San Fernando Valley. We had good connections with them. And so this is a picture of actually Eva, one of our uh, promotoras who was going out to Proyecto del Barrio and doing a presentation on La Clave. So these are mostly the primary care providers, which could include nurse practitioners, social workers, et cetera, as well as the docs. This is our other uh, promotora, Rosalba, who is working with uh, LAPD, the mission division that we would go to uh, when they had community events as well and talk to them about uh, La Clave and let them know about it. And you'll see how this plays into a, a, one of the stories that we'll tell you in a minute regarding um, a patient that got referred to us from, uh, from the community. We also use newspapers. So La Opinion is the largest Spanish language newspaper uh, in Los Angeles and lots of parts of the, of the United States. Uh, and so they ran some articles, as you can see here, La Clave to para tratar los enfermedades mentales to treat uh, mental illnesses. So we had that running quite a few times in, in the newspaper. And then we also had some television and radio spots. So both in terms of Univision, uh, Channel 34, and a, a story. Uh, on April 18, 2017. We also participated in a few uh, community councils, uh, KISS FM and... Uh, okay. Another technique that we used in, the, in this uh, campaign included the use of uh, junior poster boards, up to 60 different poster boards spread out all over the San Fernando Valley, particularly the area that we were targeting for the educational campaign. And the poster boards look something like this. So you might drive by and you would see the, the La Clave. This is a scene from that La Clave movie that Steve was talking about. And it says, use La Clave. And so identify symptoms and get help and serious mental illness treatable. And it refers people to the uh, website so they can get more information, as well as that 1-800 number that is actually connecting people to the San Fernando Mental Health Center. Okay. We also use bus benches, as you can see the La Clave over here. And this time in Spanish, this bus bench. And then yet another area. So this is the website that you're seeing. So if you actually go to uselaclave.com, you will get, or www.uselaclave.com, you'll be able to access this website, which includes, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the movie, but also a lot of more information related to psychosis and where to get help. All right. So what I tell you is over the course of the year that we the campaign, we're able to we did the, the message. So for, for that one year period, we contacted at least over, well, over 13,000 people and over 4, 500 organizations with the message. 
clave and with respect to the psychosis. Um, in terms of the general public, we reached over a thousand uh, monthly personal contacts at community events, and they attended on an average about 70, 70 community events every month. Uh, the general public professionals had 760 total contacts, workshops, 60 a month. Uh, in terms of professional networking, as you can see, there are 824 people uh, over the course of the year, and they attended on an average seven working events per month. Uh, and generally speaking, we had very positive feedback, situation of message. Many of the uh, people that we work with were very uh, expecting us to come back, present over and over again, just to let their, their locals know more about this project. We also can see that the message was received. And we have some evidence of that because our one, we were tracking the 1-800 number, when it was coming in, when people would call. And we could tell that over the course of the time where people were calling, that they were at, we would have a bump. So, if, for example, every time we had some kind of an event, there would be a spike in the number of phone calls that we would get at that 1-800 that then would roll over to the San Fernando Mental Health Center. The biggest one, not surprisingly, was our TV. When we had a TV spot that talked about uh, La Clave, there was a, a, a huge sp uh, spike in the number of phone calls that we got um, to, the, uh, to, to our um, to, to our one eight hundred number. Not all of them necessarily were coming from the local catchment area. When you use TV, it can go beyond that. So there were a lot of calls that came from outside of the San Fernando Valley, but still within California. But again, that's where the trick is with the campaign. Depending on how targeted your approach is, you may get different results. We, the next thing that I want to mention is the survey of participants. So we actually asked the individual, because the whole point of the campaign is to get people referred to us and hopefully earlier in, the, in their illness course so that we could reduce of untreated psychosis. And so we would ask every person that was had heard of La Clave. And it turns out, not surprisingly, in the baseline before we started the campaign, not one of the 40 we that were in their first episode had heard of La Clave. However, during the time of our campaign, up to nine out of the 55 individuals actually reported that they had heard something about La Clave when they were, uh, when they were in the intake interview that we were doing at our, at our clinic. And then after the campaign was over, dropped back down a little back to two out of the 20 individuals uh, who were brought into our clinic had heard of La Clave uh, prior to being brought into the clinic. This is one case uh, that I was uh, alluding to earlier, an anecdote about the value of the La Clave. So this was a, a, a patient or a, the father of a patient who uh, had met one of our promotoras at a swap meet. And they, she had met them a couple times and it handed out La Clave information. They talked because the father had approached her and talked about the fact that he had a son who had these symptoms of psychosis, but wasn't quite as to the reason for it, whether it was drug addiction or that it had an inherent me mental illness per se. And so they had talked quite a bit. And a particular evening, the son had become um, aggressive. And so they called the police. Uh, and when the police showed up, the father had told the police that he wanted his son taken in for drug treatment. Um, but what happened was is that the police said, no, we're not, we don't have a, a drug program to take him to. We're either going to book him and take him to jail or we're going to take him to the hospital. There are only two choices. And then at that point, there was a mention, the, the police officer actually mentioned, because he had been part of our campaign, that uh, there was a program called La Clave at the hospital, and that maybe that that would be a place where the, the, the son would get some treatment. And so that actually opened up the eyes of the, of the said, I've heard of La Clave. I know about it. Go ahead and take him to the hospital. And so it kind of resolved itself quite well that the police officer and the father knew of La Clave, which uh, got them to get, get to a point of mutual agreement and basically led to the patient being brought to the hospital and entered into our, into our program. So it's kind of a nice, feel good story, your efforts. You know, we do all this, but to hear a real anecdote that really, really worked was a really uh, reinforcing kind of an experience. Okay, so now regarding that so the number of people that we brought in over the course of the, of the campaign and beyond was uh, 131 patients. As you can see, almost three quarters of them, of them male, uh, almost two thirds of them born in the United States. Uh, here you see the 24 or so, 25 years old, which is a little bit younger than some of the studies that we see in, uh, in, in the United States. 
but about comparable to the studies that we see in Europe in terms of first episodes of psychosis. So right around Yes, you see the education and uh, the level of English and Spanish speaking. Most of these individuals were actually bilingual. The patients themselves are mostly bilingual. Okay, this is looking at the distribution of the duration of untreated psychosis. Specifically, one measure is the onset to first antipsychotic medication. And as you can see here, when you look at the data, it's pretty clear that about half had a duration of untreated psychosis of less than six months, right? Tail that goes all the way median actually comes out to be about 39 weeks overall with regard to the entire sample. The mean obviously is much skewed to the left, so more, more like two, two or just about two years or so of a mean because of this long tail that we have here. So again, roughly about 39 weeks median, uh, which is much longer than what when, when is desirable, although shorter than the folks at Ray's who found something more on the order of about a year and a half. So at least in our population, it was about half of what they had found in the RAISE project. This is looking at another measure of the DUP, because you can measure the DUP in a variety of different ways. One is all the way to the first antipsychotic. Another one is the first attempt at, at health seeking, getting to the clinic in the first place prior to being brought, uh, put, being put on antipsychotic medication. And so you see here roughly the same kind of data, about half or less than six months, the median about 23 weeks, the mean about four years. All right, so this I want to run through real quickly is basically what our hypotheses were for our study. So when we actually did the uh, you know, study and proposed it to NIH, we really said there were two things we were expecting to find. And these are the two we were most focused on. What to do with the, the campaign itself, we would be able to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis. So from the time period where we started, we'd have a certain level of duration of untreated psychosis run the campaign, and hopefully we would reduce that duration of untreated psychosis in that community. So you can see that represented here. So the difference between the 16-month baseline versus the 24-month during the campaign, we expected the DUP to go down and then hopefully to continue that way even when the campaign was over in that post-campaign period. So that's hypothesis one. Hypothesis two has to do with the difference between the groups and the groups being those born in the United States and those foreign born. And there's some literature like uh, Steve was referring to about Maggie Alegria and others showing uh, a more difficult time in accessing services for people who are bo foreign born. So our assumption was the same idea, that there would be a longer duration of untreated psychosis in the, at baseline for the foreign born versus the, uh, the US born, and that that would continue to some extent over the course of the campaign. So those are our major uh, predict or our hypotheses. So what did we find? Well, this is actually showing you the data across the different time frames. So this is baseline to the campaign and then post-campaign. And the blue refers to people who were not born. So these are the immigrant population and the red are the U.S. born Latinos. Okay. And so what you see here is there actually are some main effects. There's a main effect for time across time. There was a difference in terms of the campaign having a difference compared to uh, overall in terms of the time period. Also, whether or not you were born in the United States, there's a main effect for that as well across the time periods. And there actually is an interaction between time and born in the United States. So there is definitely a signal that there is a difference between the time, across time for these different populations. Okay. Looking at the specifics of the different uh, durations of untreated psychosis, what you see here, first I'll look at the foreign born you're going to see in, in terms of the, this is the duration of untreated psychosis, the time to any treatment, and then the column over, these two columns are time to first prescribe medication. And then the U.S. born. And what you're seeing is that in terms of uh, foreign born versus, no matter which one of these criteria you use as duration of untreated psychosis, in both cases, the foreign born has significantly increased duration of untreated psychosis versus the US born. And that you know, comes out whether you transform the data or you transform both. Also the case for first uh, treatment with antipsychotic medication, about twice long for people who are foreign born compared to the US born. Now, when we look at whole, uh, you know, really the comparisons across the groups with respect to the campaign and its effect. Um, so at first, I'm going to give you the caveat that at least from a statistical point of view, there really isn't a statistically significant 
difference across the different time points. So um, I want to use that as a caveat at first, but I also want to mention that these, these groups have very large standard deviations. There's a lot of variance in between the groups, so it might not have been so easy to find. But I will point to one of my mentors, uh, um, a professor of psych psychiatry here at UCLA for many years, Jim Mintz, who used to say all the time is that you need to think not just about statistics, but also what's called the intraocular test, that something that hits you right between the eyes. And to me, although I understand this is looking at the data of the pa patients, people that were referred to our program from outside the catchment area. And clearly we did not target that catchment area for the educational campaign. So across the three time periods, you wouldn't expect to find very much difference between the groups. However, inside that area, the part of the San Fernando Valley that we had focused all the bulletin boards and the, and the radio and the whatever, all the different kinds of uh, community uh, visits, et cetera, there does seem to be, at least to my intraocular test, a drop from you know, the, the baseline period to the campaign and then a return up afterwards after the campaign is over. So again, the caveat is the statistics aren't there, but I'd like to believe that there is a signal that's worth pursuing and perhaps it has to, more to do with some of the limitations of our uh, procedures and maybe how, much, how long our campaign, but I'll go into that in a second. So summarizing our main findings, hopefully I'm doing in good time. The message was delivered and received as I, as I showed. The campaign contributed to a reduction time to any treatment seeking, but unfortunately, at least statistically, it did not seem to contribute in time to first antipsychotic medication. Uh, and say equivocally that the immigrant population uh, did have a significantly longer duration of untreated psychosis than the U.S. and Latinos. So in terms of if we were going to do this again or if we were going to get some more funding or whatever the case may be, in terms of uh, our procedure would be to strengthen the campaign. And that would include preparing for the full launching the campaign. Uh, in the, what we did was we hit the ground running. We started hiring people, making things up as we were going along. I mean, we planned it all out, but we were in a hurry to get that campaign going. And so there is some reasons to believe that the campaign could have been a little bit stronger what we were doing before we did it. Now we have a better sense of how to reach out to the community. I think we would do a, a better job of doing so, uh, and including training for sustainability, which means not just relying on our promotoras, but also training, you know, training the trainers and getting other people in the community to uh, send the message out about psychosis literacy. Um, another idea would be to extend that campaign. Two years went by really fast. And so a longer campaign as in other places like in Australia, and in Nor and Norway seem to show some benefits in extending the campaign uh, past that time. And then finally, something that Steve alluded to as well is to embed the campaign within the air. We were ref referring people to the clinic at that San Fernando, but that clinic is not specifically designed to take on first episode patients and, and really provide that real evidence-based practice of all the different components of coordinated uh, services. We have those various components, but there's not a team specifically assigned to do first episode psychosis. So in the future, it might be even better, especially because we had discovered that a lot of patients, you know, once you connect them to the clinic, they may not maintain, you know, engagement. And it takes a lot of effort to make sure that you not just recruit individuals to participate, but stay in the program as well. Sometimes it takes a sort of act of uh, sort of community treatment type of work to be able to maintain that. So conclusions, uh, we can honestly say that early intervention in psychosis can reduce illness burden to clients and families. We've used the theory that Steve was talking about, developed evidence-based community messages and implemented messages in community intervention. Uh, although our campaign fell short seeing the direct treated psychosis of Latino first psychosis, we do believe that it shows some some uh, additional work in the, in the uh, procedures. Um, as we develop interventions, we probably shouldn't overlook the, Steve had mentioned that almost all the campaigns are in high income countries. And if we're gonna extend this work, we might wanna think about what would we do differently or in addition with the low and medium income countries as well as in minority countries, even in the United States. Um, it may be the case of providing services in and of itself is not enough because that doesn't bring people to the, to the clinic. Um, so we should not forget about the campaign and the outreach efforts, which are the critical component in reducing the duration of untreated psychosis. 
We're hopeful, and this is one of the you know plans going forward, that both coordinated specialty services in conjunction with a strong educational campaign will reduce the duration of untreated psychosis in underserved communities like the one we described today. That should be the funding for, the, for this program, just to be fully disclosure, National Institute of Mental Health, the National as well as the Community Foundation. And our other investigators that Steve put into this team, one member of this team, include Doe Mayer, uh, uh, Concepcion Barrio, and Bill Vega from USC, Jody Ullman, and Carmen Lara from Puebla, Mexico. And I think that's it. This is our contact information. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Yes, this is actually a much more important study than the uh, audience uh, uh, realized. I mean, we have a much lower audience than usual. I don't know why, the ACMP or something, but not everybody goes to that. But this is a very important study. I, I'm reminded, actually, both of you, of um, uh, some years ago I used to chair um, a committee for the German uh, federal government on um, advances in psychiatry. And um, one of the things we did was we did a similar study in Strasbourg, but for suicide, um, in which there was a major campaign, not only from the mental health community, but also within the structure of the town itself, so that there were advertisements and there were all sorts of other connecting links which really invaded the life of the town. It's not a huge town like uh, we are here, but it would be similar to some of the suburban areas that you were dealing with. And it had, of course, you've got a very interesting endpoint because uh, you can tell whether people uh, complete the suicide or just uh, think about it and contact somebody. And it was a dramatic uh, reduction over a period of about three years. That we, and then it went into the, uh, of course, that's a much more organized country social-wise than we are, it went into the fabric, and I presume, although I haven't followed it up, it, it, it sustained itself. It's, um, <coughs> excuse me. So these, these ideas of we have to get back into the river, uh, the stream that's bringing all these persons down, I think is very, very important. And we don't do that very well. Uh, here in the U.S., and we don't do it here either, in, in, even in L.A., where we could do more of it. Uh, the other interesting thing to me is uh, that you were really working at the interface of two, two cultures, and I think it's fascinating to see that you're, the persons who are not yet acculturated, if you will, although one might want to, again, if I'm being somewhat cynical, I'll extrapolate on that, but I won't, the, the fact is that persons who come more recently, um, embedded in their own culture still, do not really recognize the value of something like this. It, of course, there's a flip there as well. If you, you know, obesity is the other way around, that people who come uh, in the Hispanic community, which has a lot of obesity, do very well before they get acculturated, and then they, then they become fat, yes? So I think that... Um, it, these particular cultural cross currents are very, very important. And but I, 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 we should open up for some discussion. But I was, I was particularly interested in uh, what you might say, both of you, about the, you know, the. I think you, the the early psychosis in intervention programs have become somewhat more uh, interesting to the. Uh, to the counties and to the way yes. in which we fund those things. Mm -hmm. So I understand that Davis, who's been doing a lot of this, has now got $20 million, you've heard this perhaps, yes. uh, to invest in programs that are not just in that county but beyond. And right. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit, either of you, both of you, to where you see this uh, pioneering work going in terms of perhaps reaching out within the county system to the county systems across the state that would actually um, give some sure. energy behind what you've both shown. I, I can suggest, Let me give you. I, I have, uh, Dr. Capello, it's not, I, I, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, all right. Um, 
So actually, there's a Southern California Regional Partnership, which is the administrative branch for the MHSA funds. Mm -hmm. Uh, Los Angeles County has their own administrative branch. You might but tell for them what the MHSA account, is. Oh, Mental Health Service Act. Um, so these are funds that, that go directly to improving mental health services in the public sector. Mm -hmm. Well, they asked us to give a talk, and 10 counties were interested in doing La Clave. Um, and, so they, and then I got on the phone and provided a proposal, and they said they couldn't come into agreement to do so. But Kern County did, and so we're in Kern County. We're, the, the plan is, with some of the MHSA funds, we're training their county personnel to carry out the La Clave. We're not going to do that, but we're going to train them to carry it out. And we'll give them the toolkits, we'll give them the training manuals, uh, we'll train them, etc. cetera. Um, but we're open to explore this with other counties as well. Uh, but it's, it's not easy uh, negotiating these kinds of uh, relationships, um, yes. Kern County, of course, is where we have another uh, UCLA mm -hmm. uh, training program. And so you might want to hook up with that as well. Yes. Right, yeah. right. So as, as Steve was saying, the funding opportunities are like you were saying, the funding opportunities are growing. Both SAMHSA on the program level as well as NIMH are very interested in first episodes. SAMHSA has funded a variety of first episode projects, including ones that have an outreach component to it. So SAMHSA's on board. They realize that you need to not just expect people to come when you build it, but you have to inform them of what's there. So that's going on. As a matter of fact, as we speak, there's a training going on in LA County to do an outreach program for people who are not just first episode, but even moving it up to people who are at ultra high risk for first episode. There's uh, five clinics around Los Angeles County that are gonna be providing this outreach service to try to identify people in that clinical high risk uh, population and get them into services that may not, again, not first episode, but clinical high risk for psychosis. And again, NIH is also, as you know, has been putting together a variety of different uh, RFAs that are focused on a uh, hub and spoke model where there'll be a, an a academic center partnering with community sites and that we're hoping to be able to participate in one of those as well. And we've had, of course, an early psychosis program here for a long, long time. Um, I'm not sure how much we move out in this model to the community, however. Yes. But let's pass on to questions. Yes. Sure. Uh, by the way, this thing can get moved around. Okay. Hi, Alex. Uh, good to see you again. Hi. Uh, a, a comment and, and a question. So um, I really like how you engage the, the religious community. Working in the VA, we often hear stories about veterans who, when they have any type of um, mental health issues, the first point of contact is the chaplain rather than the corpsman or, or the physicians. And the question is regarding adherence and engagement. I imagine one of the intentions or potentially even unintended side effects of the campaign was not just to only uh, instruct people about the signs of psychosis, but also decrease the stigma. So I'm curious about your existing patients where you've maybe had uh, issues with medication adherence. Did you see any improvement there? People more accepting about their diagnosis, more accepting about taking their medications? Yeah, I'm glad you said it. So I don't know, Steve, is this a good opportunity to talk about? Go, go ahead. So one of the things go back and forth on, you know, the model that Steve presented about the health literacy leading to illness attribution, leading to coming to services. That looks really good on paper and it makes kind of sense. We're not sure it's actually the way people get into services because a lot of it I personally feel has, and Steve has shared this with me, is more on relationships. So a lot of it has to do with not so much that we've convinced somebody, okay, when you have one of these symptoms, you should get, realize this is psychosis and go to a clinic. A lot of it is that promotora that I showed you, Rosalba and Eva, she developed a relationship with the dads and many other dads as well, so that when their son or daughter was suffering, they'd call Rosalba and she would reassure them that they should come to the clinic, right? It was the connection with Rosalba. Then when they got to the clinic, we formed new relationships, our caseworkers, our research coordinators, et cetera. They knew them on a personal basis. So it wasn't like a linear thing that, okay, get information. It was really the personal connections, maybe more the way that an assertive community treatment team works in this sort of advocacy way. I think that had more to do with, you know, people bouncing around in and out of treatment and trying to maintain them. Because as you're quite right, although in general, we think that first episode patients are more likely to be adherent than later on, um, that's not necessarily the case. That first year or two can be a bumpy road. 
And so you have to be able to maintain that level of engagement. And we certainly found that our relationships were critically important, as well as the knowledge that they were gaining from our, our efforts. But just, just to follow up, our, we have a flip chart called Use la, uh, la Clave Sin Luz. We trained promotores in Mexico to show the DVD. And to do the DVD player, you need a laptop, you need a LCD projector, you need uh, and, and we go into this woman's home who has is a promotor, and I ask, where's the outlet? <laughs> she didn't have an outlet for our electronic equipment. And uh, fortunately, we had an extension cord and went back in the far bedroom where we could connect everything. So we had to come up with uh, non-electronic ways of teaching people. And so we have this flip chart that tells a story about Olga, and she develops these uh, unusual behaviors and how people didn't recognize it. And it's illustrated, like the, the one where you see going from one subject to the other with disorganized speech. And so that's really useful. Uh, you could have that in your clinic, uh, in your office, and you could bring it out and show it to people. Look, let me tell you the story about Olga. You see, and Olga has the same things that your son have, that, that your son has. And so it could be useful in that, in, in that context. Yeah. Um, I think it's twelve oh one. We have, we have, we have one, more more, uh, one more question, and then we'll, uh, we're parting. Got it. Steve and Alex, thanks so much. That's really just fantastic work. And you mentioned in the beginning something about EpiNet, the Bob Heinsohn organized, mm -hmm. um, you know, early psychosis intervention network that's really sort of bridging clinical and research work. And I, I didn't know how your work fits into that. Do you already have plans to work with EpiNet to deploy? these systems in underserved communities and so, Spanish-speaking communities, because it seems like a perfect fit. So uh, Alex and I talked about maybe applying for that, um, but we really didn't have the team, the informatics, and uh, it's really quite an elaborate uh, proposal. But uh, Tara Needham uh, is the PI at UC Davis, and she has the $20 million, as well as the EpiNet out of UC Davis. And I'm a consultant on that grant. Um, and so I've met with them at least on one occasion. I'll be meeting them on a, on a, a regular basis and pushing the importance of, of uh, reaching out to the community. Uh, but uh, Alex and I have our eyes on other application. Uh, uh, we submitted one recently uh, to extend this to Mexico. And we, uh, this is through the Fogarty. And we didn't get scored the first time. We got scored right on the bubble. They said, address our, the limitations. We did. We were hopeful. And they said, sorry. Um, but uh, we could easily take this to Latin America as well. Um, and so we, we've got ideas. Uh, but yes, we, 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 we th we'd like to put some more energy behind it. Well, thanks to both of you. And uh, come back soon. Thank you. Thank you.